you very much. It's an honor to be here and present some of our work. Um, just as uh, I have no commercial relationships, the fuzzy platinum microcoil, which I'm going to describe today, is used for intravascular coagulation of uh, AV malformations in the brain approved by the FDA. So back in about 2002, 2003, uh, we started to notice uh, more uh, nodules in our clinics, how to assess these nodules. And this was really due to the rise of the uh, rapid thin slice low dose CT scanners, more lung cancer screening programs occurring. We started one in British Columbia. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm just gonna talk about nodules less than 20 millimeters and really more interested in less than 10 millimeters. But we're gonna see, as Dan said, a lot of nodules, and I think we have to figure out some uh, management algorithms uh, to help us. As he said, uh, the National Lung uh, Screening Trial was a game changer, which really showed for the first time, and uh, I've been in thoracic surgery a long time, it's nice to see a positive result uh, that looks like we can start to improve survival. But, uh, um, one of the problems is uh, uh, in these high-risk smokers, there are a lot of nodules. And in the uh, NLST trial, about uh, one to four percent underwent some diagnostic procedure. The risk of major calculation, uh, complications was about 4.5 and 10,000. And 25 percent of the surgical procedures showed benign disease. So we have to get a balance uh, to avoid missing a cure on the one hand and unnecessary invasive procedures for benign lesions on the other. So back in 2003 in British Columbia, we started a um, lung cancer screening program and we've now screened about 2,900 patients. Uh, they're over 55 with 30 pack years. Um, about 20 percent of them have nodules. The ones we get real interested in are the nodules that grow or thicken on two or more follow-up scans. There's about a 70% chance of cancer. And a 3.7% of individuals with nodules had cancer. So one of the things we looked at is, when you look at the initial CT scan on a screen, what are the ones that really start to worry about? One is obviously nodule size. Semi-solid greater than solid greater than non-solid. This is all. These are ranks: speculation, upper lobe nodules, uh, female gender, family history of lung cancer, emphysema, and age. The ones that you don't have to be too worried about are the ones in the fissures, uh, or if there's a large number of nodules. The more nodules, the less chance it is of cancer. And basically, what we did was we looked at uh, the type of uh, uh, tumor and the size to determine um, which ones had uh, evidence of cancer. So here is the probability of cancer. This is the nodule size. So for the ground glass or non-solid group, it takes a very large lesion before there's, you start to see an increased chance of cancer. For the semi-solids, you can actually see that they have a high incidence of cancer, you know, even at small uh, sizes in our, in our study. And for the solids, it's somewhere in between. So this was an interesting finding for us, and, and like Dan, we spend a lot of attention on patients who develop thickness in, uh, in nodules. So we use the Fleischner criteria, investigate the, the lesions over 10 millimeters right away, uh, and, and, and follow them out. Now, it's just, uh, radiation is an issue. Uh, one CT scan is about 50 chest x-rays. So you have to start thinking about how many uh, CTs you want to give your patients. But what's our follow-up strategy in the nodules? So we want to find any new or growing nodules. We want to investigate um, nodules greater than 10 millimeters or those that are growing or thickening on two or more follow-up CTs. Is really only a definitive benign pathological diagnosis by CT guided needle biopsy or bronchoscopy eliminates surgery, surgical resection, and pathological diagnosis is the gold standard. If the nodules are unchanged for after two years, we don't follow them anymore, but we have seen some develop cancers later on. So what are the best diagnostic tests? And Dan's talked about this a little bit. A CT scan, bronchoscopy, CT guided needle biopsy, or resection. So this is in our group. Uh, we, uh, we had 119 patients that we operated on that got uh, CT PET scans. 
And what we found was the PET diagnosis changed in about a third of these patients with the final pathology. So 10 of the 27 benign nodules were PET positive and 29 of the 92 cancers were PET negative. So I, 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 we've really been very specific about what, who we do PET scans on now because they're not that helpful as far as the diagnosis is concerned. Bronchoscopy Dan's talked about, uh, virtually useless. And this is, I think, where the area of growth is going to be, and I think Dan's alluded to this, that, um, you know, this was a study done in 2005 for under 20 millimeters. There's really no studies looking at under 10 millimeters, but 44% and now up to 75% in under 20 millimeters. So I think this is an area, as, as we say, we talk about hybrid management, uh, particularly with fiducials and uh, SBRT is going to be interesting. What about CT-guided needle biopsy? Well, in the best, and this is really operator dependent, and, and you get the best uh, interventional radiologist, under 10 millimeters, about 45%. 10 to 15, about 75%. Greater than 15, about 85%, 20% pneumothorax rate, uh, and about a 2 to 5% uh, chest tube rate. One of the things we got, uh, we found out is that if you get a hematoma around one of these nodules that you're trying to find and you don't get a diagnosis, it is a problem because it takes a couple of months for this to clear away and actually get back on track to see if these things are growing. So this is the thoracic surgeon's problem. There's a patient with a growing eight millimeter nodule in the right upper lobe. CT uh, guided needle biopsy and bronchoscopies were negative. You can't feel it, you can't see it, and uh, the Japanese and ourselves identified a high conversion rate to thoraco open thoracotomy uh, with attempted VATS diagnostic resection because they really just couldn't find it. And this was what got me interested, and this case was what got me interested in finding out what's the ideal localization method for VATS wedge resection. One of the keys, I think, whether it's the coil where I'm going to talk about or the fiducials, you've got to be able to mark the deep margin of the nodule, high visibility, easily deployed close to target, atraumatic, can't embolize, will not diffuse, inert, comfort and stability, ideally part of your regular process. And so we looked at, I actually operated on pigs in a CT scanner for a while trying to figure out if we could use that. The gantries are too small and I got fried. Um, need, uh, in, in ultrasound, you, it's, it's uh, Moishe Lieberman's shown that it can be effective in patients with reasonable lung function, patients with bad emphysema. I don't have the patience to wait till the air goes away to find them, so I find this not as helpful. For uh, injected media, one of the problems, and in the, in the Mayo ha has had good luck with uh, technetium injection, but they can diffuse anthropotic uh, pigmentation for the methylene blue, stroke risk, there's been embolization, risk of shock if you get in a vessel, and also you're bringing radiation into the uh, OR with the radionucleotide. Hook wires were very, are commonly used in Asia. Big problem is they hang out of the chest, they can dislodge if they tear out, you can't find the nodule, big pneumothorax, pleural pain, and there has been descriptions of massive air embolism. So one day I was having lunch with our neuroradiologist, and we were talking, I was talking about her problem. He suggested we look at this microcoil. So basically it's eight centimeters in length. It has fuzz on the outside, platinum. You can actually put it through a 22 gauge needle. That's the same size as you do a CT guided needle biopsy. It eliminates embolization risk. You can mark the nodule and the pleura. So we uh, decided to try this. So basically on the day of the operation, the patient comes to the CT scanner, locals put in, needles put deep to the lesion, we drop three centimeters of the coil deep to the lesion. Then the proximal end's brought up to the visceral pleura most of the time. And you can then sit down with the radiologist before, uh, while the patient's being transferred to the OR, go over, you know, 3D reconfiguration, see where the blood vessels are, what's your best plan of attack to try to get that out. So in the OR, double lumen tube, uh, drop the lung right away, fluoroscopy, find out where the coil is, port placement, 
fluoroscopic guided stapled wedge resection, specimen retrieved in an endo bag, fluoroscope them, immediate uh, frozen section, further staging and resection as indicated. So this is what the coil looks like on the surface of the lung. That's what it looks like in fluoroscopy. And the idea is to, if you get the coil out, you got the nodule out. So this is just an example, thoroscope, grasping forcep, microcoil, and 60 millimeter in length green stapler. We always uh, get a fluoro of the a specimen we take out to make sure we got the coil out and the nodule out. And one of the nice things about this is the, the, the pathologist, you can cut a microtome through the coil. The coil actually takes them to the nodule so they know where, they, where it is and so you're not messing around with it. So we get frozen in all of them except the uh, uh, GGOs. We found that it's better to inflate them and go home and, and deal with what you've got afterwards, but the rest of them we've been able to get frozen on. So we, what we tried to do is look at the safety and efficacy of the, no, the coil in, introduction, in, introduction, the VATS resection, cost and utility, and follow-up. So our inclusion criteria are growing or thickening peripheral lung nodules in a lung cancer screening trial, a new lung nodule that manifested after surgical resection of a previous lung cancer, a new lung nodule that manifested after chemotherapy surgery or both for treatment of an extrathoracic malignancy with a primary site showing evidence of recurrence, and a newly diagnosed non-calcified nodule. So we had 194 patients with 200 uh, two undiagnosed uh, nodules. But to say, what are the exclusion criteria for this procedure? I think if the lesion is within two centimeters of a major vessel, you're not going to get a safe resection with this thing. So that's an exclusion. And then you might say that the same of a major bronchi, but certainly the vessel. So in any event, we had 192 patients with 200 nodules. Um, uh, more females than males, 62 years of age, FEV1 of about 2.5. The median size was about 11.6 millimeters, anywhere from 4 to 17 millimeters. It, we, we only do this if it's uh, deep to the pleura. If we think it's on the pleura and we can see it, we'll just go in and take it out. But so, so it went anywhere from 5 millimeters to six, six, uh, 63 millimeters deep from the visceral pleura. So some of them were deep. So what about the safety of the putting the coil in? Well, we had a, uh, we had, uh, a 1% uh, indication for uh, a chest tube, and we found a small hemothorax, a thoracoscopy, and another one. Median time to do it, 30 minutes. The, the radiologist put it with it deep to the nodule in 97% of the time, and I always go over the CT just to find out where things are. 74% visceral pleura, 19% uh, were in the lung parenchyma, I'll talk about bracketing. Chest wall, initially we had problems, and I'll just show you how we manage that if we see it in the chest wall. So this is an example of the proximal end of the coil in the chest wall. We, we, we tell the, the uh, anesthesiologist not to collapse the lung. We sneak in with a thoracoscope and a grasping force to pull it out of the chest wall, and then we collapse the lung and proceed. So I think that's an important thing. It doesn't happen very much anymore because we tend to want to do what we call bracketing now. Um, which is basically putting the needle deep into the, the deep end there and the proximal end, not on the visceral surface, but actually deep into the lung. So that really just gives us a guideline. Uh, it's a little harder to find thoroscopically, but fluoroscopically you can find it easily. So how good was this thing in relationship to getting the lesion out? So, we, in 97% of the time, we're completely removed the, the coil and the nodule using a VATS wedge resection. Five patients need a segmentectomy or lobectomy by, uh, by open thoracotomy or VATS to resect it. We just couldn't get safely around the nodule with the stapler. Operative time for the wedge, half an hour. Fluor fluoroscopy time, 45 seconds. Four uh, uh, st uh, staple cartilages uh, uh, for, um, for excision. When we looked at a, a linear regression for operating time, what was dependent on nodule depth, obviously, fluoroscopy time, and location of the segment of the nodule. You get to learn uh, anatomy very well using this technique. So most of the nodules were in the upper lobe, right and left, but the ones that took the longest time were in the lower lobe and the anterior segments, uh, uh, superior lingula of the left upper lobe. So 
the flat surfaces of the lung where you've got a deep nodule, that's the tough part. And these are basically the segments again. This was the, these were the ones that caused us the most problems down in the lower lobes, in the posterior basal segments. Uh, hard to get the stapler on sometimes. So what about the safety? No mortality, no interoperative bleeds. We've had some uh, air leaks, one in 10, because some of these the wedges are real deep. Okay, so I think that's been our problem. Uh, Atelectasis, is pleural effusions, no re-ops. And what we did, uh, we looked at the FEV1 decrease in the wedge patients um, three months afterwards. It drops by about 6%. What about costs? Well, it's $170 uh, for a coil needle kit. But, and, and these are all the costs that we've looked at. But more importantly, if you use the coil, it's cheaper than without the coil. So we've, we've done a study now to look at that. So the coil insertion by the radiologist is about $600. Length of hospital stays about the same. But what you're chewing up this is, is an OR time. So it costs you a little bit more for the equipment, but it's a lot shorter to do the operation with the coil than without the coil. So what do we, we have about 23% uh, benign, 16% metastasis, 60% primary lung cancers. The big ones in the benign groups were the granulomas and the post-inflammatory scars. If we see GGOs or semi-solids, we'll treat them with some antibiotics and see if they go away, and they occasionally do. Uh, one of them required a diagnostic lobectomy just to get this uh, lesion out. Metastasis, colorectal sarcoma. We've lost two patients with uh, sarcomas for distant uh, metastasis. Lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, uh, the predominant thing we see, invasive 92%, 13% in situ, and these are the other lesions. Majority are very early lung cancers. Occasionally we've, on, on nodal staging, have picked up uh, some other nodes. How did we manage them? So wedge alone plus nodal sampling, uh, we've had no recurrences. Primary di diagnostic and therapeutic obectomy in those four that we couldn't get it out with the wedge, no recurrences. Wedge plus lobectomy plus nodal sampling. We've had uh, two deaths from N2 disease. So in the cancer patients treated with wedge alone or wedge plus lobectomy, there's been no local recurrences at medium of 32 months. So we get a CT scan at one year mark and then two year marks. This is an important issue, I think, clinical management change. So if you used a PET and a bronchoscopy and a failed needle biopsy, this procedure actually changed the diagnosis in a third of the patients. So I think it, it really shows you the importance of getting histological diagnosis. So in conclusion, it's safe and, and you can see things well. It improves visualization and localization. You just get to the lesion faster. You, get, you move on in the operating room and you get it done. The costs associated with the, the placement of the microcoil and their detection by fluoroscopy are offset by the cost savings related to decreased operating time and decreased number of staple firings. The preoperative localization uh, provided pathological diagnosis in 97% and change management in 33% of patients. And finally, marking the deep resection margin of the nodule with the microcoil has resulted in no local recurrences of cancer with wedge resections. I've reviewed papers where there's been local recurrence rates of up to 25 percent, particularly in, in metastasis. So uh, I think this is another feature that is very important in your localization procedure. Thank you very much.